Okay, a couple things. So uh, Jonathan and, and Austin are gonna be presenting on the Cantor set, which is uh, one example of a particular uh, idea that's, uh, or area in mathematics that's explored with great fervor called fractals. Okay, fractals are an interesting geometric concept. Uh, the Cantor set, uh, as these guys will articulate, is, is one example of a set that Cantor built that has some kind of what seemed to be contradictory behavior in some sense. <laughs> Okay, it's a very small set, but at the same time, it's a large set. Okay, it looks small, but it actually is very, very numerous, uh, as these guys will articulate. Um, just to remind you, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, I'll send out the Zoom uh, links to the presentations this afternoon. I only want you to attend two of the three. Okay, and they're, they're happening at three, four, and five. Um, so if you, you would be so kind to do that, that'd be great. I think Dr. Wright actually said that he would, um, you know, you could email him if you want, or you could just email me and just tell him, you know, what class you're wanting uh, credit for, but I'll also be kind of tracking things on on the Zoom sessions as well. I'll kind of uh, check through and see who's who is in attendance, if you will, okay? Any questions before we start here? All right. Uh, well, yeah, so, yeah, right, you just, well, yeah, like that, yeah. You can hit erase on there for clear. Uh, you can hit clear, it should clear, yeah. All right, guys, take it away. So, I'm Jonathan, and that's Austin, and we see ours on the cancer set, I guess. So, um, Interestingly enough, the canner set, the first, uh, it isn't the exact canner set as we know it, but the most uh, most appropriate way to say this is that Henry Smith uh, discovered more or less, uh, or at least proposed the first idea similar to a canter set um, in about uh, 1874. Um, he did not actually uh, propose the exact canter set that we now know it as, um, and it wasn't published until 83 when George Cantor uh, himself published it. Um, so George Cantor, he was uh, actually born in Russia. Uh, his father was a merchant, um, pretty successful one. Uh, he lived there till uh, through a bit of his early life um, eventually moving back to Germany um, when his father got sick. Uh, he was a son of, um, his father was uh, a very strong Protestant. His mother was Roman Catholic and together they helped him to form a great basis of faith, uh, particularly in the Lutheran church. Um, he's best known for developing set theory, which um, we now use as one of our fundamental ways to understanding mathematics. And it's a lot of how we communicate a lot of our mathematical ideas. Um, he also developed uh, the concept of the infinite in mathematics. Uh, he took it from the idea of the philosophical infinite and he expanded upon that to uh, consider different types of infinity, different levels. Um, he's the one who proposed the countable and uncountable infinities. Um, he also introduced uh, transfinite numbers, which um, I don't know a whole lot about, but as from what I can understand, they're numbers that are extremely, almost arbitrarily large, uh, but not infinity. Um, so they're extremely difficult to define sometimes, but they're still not infinite. Um, they're things that at first glance might seem quite infinite, but aren't. Um, he also developed something called point set topology, uh, which sometimes is just called general topology. Um, it's one of the fundamental uh, ideas in topology. It's, as it kind of implies, it takes the ideas of points and sets and puts it into a way that is uh, very, 
very accurately and precisely expressed in the ideas of topology. Can I uh, shift over that way maybe a little bit just so that people can hear uh, oh, yeah. and hear you better? Yeah. Um, he actually faced a lot of uh, backlash to uh, his ideas. Um, his innovations were very groundbreaking at times. Um, some of them seemed very counterintuitive to the point where a lot of the other mathematical figureheads at the time uh, would either disagree with or at least spend a whole lot of effort trying to uh, dispel his ideas. Um, because of this opposition and the stress of his work overall, he developed uh, depression pretty severely. Um, he was actually hospitalized for it a, a few times, I believe. Um, and it was his faith that kind of pushed him to keep going forward. Um, he saw his work into the infinite as a way of um, almost understanding God, not in the sense that you can fully understand him, but that we as humans, there are certain amounts that we can get to know about him. And this helped him to progress his understanding of God as he was able to say that this was infinite and this was such an uncountably infinite that he was he was blown away by possibility and the ideas of how great infinity was. It helped to kind of expand uh, his thought process a lot. Um, his faith actually uh, provoked him to um, teach some philosophy uh, seminars as well because of how strongly he he felt in that in that uh, way. Um, however, his ideas with infinity uh, kind of shook the ground a little in the Christian community. Um, many people saw it almost sacrilegiously as they believed that there was one infinite and that was God and there's no greater infinite than God so there couldn't be greater infinities. Of course, he saw it more so that those greater infinities speak to the depth that is the infinity of God. Um, so because of that, he also faced a lot of opposition from people who uh, at first glance might seem um, like-minded as him. All right, so the Cantor set is a set usually defined, oops, hold on, as the inter interval from zero to one, and then every uh, third is removed. So the middle third, as you can see with the diagram, the middle third is removed. So it becomes zero to one third and uh, two thirds to one. And then it's repeated so on and so forth. So Um, there's a lot of interesting properties. One has to do with the base three number system. So we all use base 10, right? Zero through nine. And then, so, a, and we all know what binary is, right? Zeros and one. So a base three system uses zeros, ones, and twos. And so one interesting property, at least of this Cantor set with the, um, the thirds removed is that every number in the Cantor set can be written using only um, the digits zero and two in uh, in a base three system. For example, one equals 0.2222 repeating, or the number uh, it was one third equals 0 0.02 repeating. So there's a lot of interesting. Uh, concepts with base three that you don't need the digit one to create any of the numbers in the Cantor set. And then, so the Cantor set has the interesting property of having a zero length. So it's an inter originally an interval right from zero to one. And then uh, adding all the distances that are eventually subtracted, it's also one. So it ends up having technically no length at all, which is quite interesting. So can you back up a couple slides? So that picture, that visual creation of it, can you see that, I mean, hopefully people can see, like, you're 
removing thirds, third thirds, and you just end up with almost nothing. So it's like that's the first third. Almost nothing eventually. Yeah, or each, it feels like that. Each segment removes the middle third from it and so on. I may have noticed that there's some t shirts around the building with that picture. Yeah, and then the other kind of interesting concept is that there's um, two different types of infinity within the set itself. So, right, we set up it as the interval from zero to one, and then we went from zero to one third and two thirds to zero or to one. Um, so, there's an infinite number of points within the Cantor set itself. But each of these endpoints, right, the zero, the one third, the two thirds, and the one, and so on, um, there's a countable number of those distinct endpoints. And how we create it is each endpoint will never be removed from the set itself, right? Because we're removing the middle third, those endpoints will always exist within the set. I feel like I'm not going to enough. Um. So this right here, I wanted to provide um, somewhat of a, I guess, a general formula uh, per se for um, what numbers are in the Cantor set, um, because it's something that intuitively feels uh, very easily constructed uh, by simply removing the middle third. It's something that um, I found a little bit difficult to uh, express in only a uh, form, a formula. Um, but however, that right there is the uh, somewhat the general form where uh, X is the number that would be uh, inside of the Cantor set. And you essentially add up an infinite number of, um, of C's divided by uh, 3N, um, where C can either be zero or two for uh, each term n, depending on which term it is. Term it is. Um, the Cantor set that we mostly refer to is called the Cantor ternary set. Um, and it, that's specifically just uh, constructed by removing the middle thirds. However, you can construct um, different sets comprised of different uh, numbers, different points, depending on how much you want to remove from the set. You could effectively take the set and remove anywhere from zero or 100% of the set in each iteration, uh, not including zero or 100. Otherwise, you obviously get um, either a completely empty set or the entire interval from zero to one. Um, what's interesting about this is that uh, the Cantor set itself, um, Cantor didn't seem to think was very groundbreaking. Um, he thought that his ideas that came from it were extremely groundbreaking. Um, it is uh, specifically defined as a set that is, per it's a perfect set that is nowhere dense, um, which means essentially that as a perfect set, each point that is in the Cantor set could technically be, um, you could technically uh, apply the derivative to it because it has points around it. Um, however, at the same time, it is nowhere dense because uh, it has a length of an overall length of zero. Um, however, you can alter this, as I said, by uh, inputting whatever amount you could, um, you, you chose uh, to remove. Um, for example, the one that I, uh, the person I talked about uh, on the first slide, Henry Smith, I believe his, um, was a set constructed by removing, uh, it was something like the middle fourth. Um, this produced some strange results as it alters the length of the set. You can actually produce a set similar to the Cantor set that does have an overall length. However, uh, Cantor found basically the uh, dividing line where if you remove over, if you remove a third or more, you end up with a set that has a sum length of zero. If you remove less than a third, then you end up with a set that can have some sort of length. Um, regardless, uh, 
that's the general form for the Panther set. However, you could alter that, as you could imagine, uh, changing the uh, denominator in order to match whatever Panther set you wish to construct. Um, and I just thought that was interesting because uh, it has some it has some weird implications because it's a set that has no length, but at the same time it's a perfect set, meaning that each point has another point next to it, effectively, um, which is something that's just kind of mind boggling to think about that you can have something that is completely not empty in the mathematical sense, but intuitively speaking, it's it's basically empty. There's nothing there, but at the same time, there's so many things there that everything there has something next to it. Um, and I just thought there was some interesting points about the Cantor set to add on top of that. And there's the Cantor set. So is the Cantor set, you, you said you can characterize it by looking at its base three Rather than base 10, it's base three expansion. Correct. And somehow it gets so there, there you only use the digits zero, one, and two. Correct. But you, uh, every element in it can be created using only zero and two. Okay, so is that so you said any element in the Cantor set can be created using only zeros and twos? Correct. Is that a necessary and sufficient condition? So if I take any number between zero and one that has binary ex or a ternary expansion, which means base three expansion, using only the digits zero and two. It is it in the Cantor set automatically? No, it's just every point can be defined. It's not necessarily insufficient, if I remember correctly. Um, hmm. I, 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 th I seem to recall that it is necessary and sufficient, and that shows that the set's uncountable. Because you can do that. Remember, we did that diagonalization argument yeah. where we said, look, if it if this was a listable set, then I can construct something that's in it. And I think you need to be able to say, look, I can tweak this zero to be a two, this two to be a zero, and I can kind of go down the diagonal and construct something that consists of zeros and twos, right? Correct. That isn't in the list. <laughs> just by kind of going along the diagonal and flipping from zeros to twos and twos to zeros. Okay. So like, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. So, so, but then I need to know that that thing is still in the Cantor set. You see what I'm saying? It, the claim is that the Cantor set is uncountable. How do I know it's uncountable? Well, Cantor would have used the same diagonalization argument. And I need to know that that thing I get from flipping zeros to twos and twos to zeros is still in the Cantor set. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I think I think it is both a necessary and sufficient condition for being in the Cantor set, but, but yeah. Well, I think it's, yeah. So uh, other uh, questions for these guys? Any questions? Yes. When he was creating this, was this before or after he started to go insane? Uh, this was, um, I believe this was kind of during. Um, yeah, I think finding something like this might make me go a little crazy too. Um, but yeah, this was actually part of that whole idea that he was ex trying to expand upon about infinity, um, which is where the uncountable infinite came right, into right, play. Right, right. Yeah. What remember he he couldn't find something that was uncountable at first. Every everything was listable, right? Everything he was finding was listable until he found until he came up with his diagonalization argument that we saw, right? Uh, when he came up with the diagonalization argument, he started to think, okay, well, is there something between like the interval from zero to one, that size of infinity, and the countable infinity. And so a next natural step would have been to try to construct something like this. You see, I mean, he actually used the interval from zero to one to construct this thing, right? He kind of took out parts and he was trying to take out just enough so that he would kind of dip below that uncountable threshold 
to something between the countable and the uncountable bread. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He was trying to construct something in between. Remember the whole thing was, is there something between the uncountable and the countable? Is there some set, set size, an infinite set size somewhere between those two? That was the so-called continuum hypothesis. Like that was the question. Um, so this construction is the thing that would have would have kind of been his attempt to try to, to rectify that. Yeah, but I think that <laughs> he probably was crazy at, at some point in the middle of this, but yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Was it Cantor that came up with the visual representation of it, or was that someone else? Uh, I don't know who came up with the visual representation of it. Um, I would assume yes, considering uh, he he developed the uh, the Cantor set that is produced by removing the middle third, um, but I'm not too sure about that one. This, I mentioned the word fractal. Do you guys see that if you zoom in on any part of this construction, so for instance, do you see the picture kind of goes like this. If I zoom in to the, just the left half over there, you see it's gonna look exactly like it did before, yeah? And then if I zoom in to the left half of that left half, it's gonna look like the same construction again. Do you see that? That's, that's how a fractal behaves. A fractal by definition has kind of like this self symmetry. When you zoom in on parts of it geometrically, it just looks like you're like, what, what's going on? This is the exact same thing I was just looking at. Does that make sense? So the Cantor set is, is an example of something we call a fractal. Uh, and it behaves, behave, fractals behave in interesting ways. There's other things you could look up. There's something called the Koch, uh, right? K-O-C-H, the Koch snowflake. Uh, which is interesting. There's something called Serpins the Serpinski carpet, which is another example where you start with a triangle and then you remove like a, a small triangle from the middle of it. Can I, can I have to, I'll draw a picture of it. Here's what the Serpinski triangle, in fact, let me just go like this easily. I mean, look, we're, we're, we're on the internet, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So we just go Serpinski, Serpinski triangle. That's what the Serpinski triangle looks like. You see that? So you can kind of see that if I zoom in, to, do you see how the construction works? You basically remove kind of an upside down triangle from the middle of this equilateral thing. And then you zoom in and do the same thing to each one of those. And then you zoom in some more and do the exact same thing. Yeah? There's something called the Manger sponge. Okay. So this is what the Manger sponge looks like. It's sort of the three-dimensional rendition of this thing. Uh, in fact, oh man, um, let me see. I know that I, I remember watching like a weird, here's a Manger sponge video. We'll just look at the first, first couple iterations of this thing. What in the world is this? Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Forget that. Oh, that's not good. There are some, oh, here it is, Serpinski's dream. So yeah, check this out. There are some of these that will actually zoom in on parts of these little fractals and you can kind of see what's happening with them. Um, but this one is, uh, oh boy, what's going on here, okay. There's this. Usually what they'll do is they'll zoom in on parts of it. So here we go. This is kind of a three-dimensional rendition of, of the Serpinski carpet. Oh boy. Do you see how it just looks? <laughs> it looks the same. So weird. And there, and you're going into like certain parts of it, and then you just feel like you're back out outside again. Kind of gives you motion sickness after a while, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm going to stop. I'm, I actually am feeling sick right now. But uh, what I wanted to do, one thing I wanted to do was the following. So let me see here.
Why is, so watch this. Why is, okay, so you guys claimed that one third is, is in there, right? Yeah. So you said that one third is in the Cantor set. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, how do I represent you, you? And the claim was you wanted to write one third as, okay, so you said that, uh, okay, I think this was you, Austin, that said it was 0.02020202. No, it's 0 .02. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. 0.02 and the QVP. Oh, 0 0.022222, two, 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 two? that's yeah. what you mean? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so you're saying it's 0 0.02222, two, 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 et cetera, yeah. okay? And what this means, what this means is that you would go, uh, this would be like zero over three plus one or plus two over three squared plus two over three cubed plus et cetera. Like there's a bunch of twos after that. That's what that means, okay? And by the way, uh, so, so the claim is one third has to be equal to that. Well, actually this is like two times one over three squared plus one over three cubed plus one over three to the fourth. Does that make sense? All I did was just factor out two, yes? And by the way, now I can actually factor out, I can factor out one over three squared also, why not, right? Two over three squared. What would be left behind if I factor out one over three squared? One, and what will be left behind from one over three cubed? That would be a third. What about from one over three to the fourth? Yeah, one third quantity squared plus et cetera, yeah? And then you can use, we saw someone, uh, quote the so-called geometric series formula at some point. I'm telling you when you have something like this, the formula is one over one minus the thing that's being raised to the power, to the higher and higher powers. So it's one over one minus what in this case? A third, okay? Which by the way is two over three squared times three over two, you see what I'm saying? Because it's one over two thirds, which is three over two. And lo and behold, what do we get? One third, you see that, right? So this, this right here is a way that you could represent the number one third in base three in a base three sort of ternary expansion. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so yeah. And basically, what I was saying is anything in the Cantor set can be yeah. built completely, what these guys were saying, can be built completely from zeros and twos and vice versa. Anything that's built from zeros and twos belongs in the Cantor set. <laughs> and, I, and Cantor could make the same argument about these, these numbers that he did about uh, the uncountability of the interval from zero to one. Basically, he just said, he just said, look, if you go along the diagonal, you just have to flip zeros to twos and twos to zeros, and you're gonna have something that can't possibly be in the list. Because for instance, if I had point two zero zero two zero zero, et cetera, and then the next thing in the list was 0 0.02022, et cetera. And then the next thing was point zero zero two zero two zero, et cetera then what could I do, and this list went on forever, what could I do to build something that can't possibly be in this list? Yeah, you just go, go down this diagonal right here and you say, well, I'm going to build something, zero point, okay, well, I'm gonna take zero in the first slot so that it's different from this guy. I'm gonna take zero in the second slot so it's different from this guy, yeah? And I'm gonna take zero in the third slot so it's different from this guy and so on and so forth. And you would just go down the diagonal and build a number that has to be in the counter set that can't possibly be in the list. Therefore, the counter set can't possibly be listable or countable, yeah? So that was kind of Cantor's argument. Cool. Any questions on that? Questions on that?
Cantor is a fascinating guy. Like I said, later on, um, somebody by the name of Kurt Girdle, G-O-Umlaut-D-E-L, proved something called the incompleteness theorem. That said, uh, any mathematical system that is complicated enough to have the natural numbers, or even like the integers in it, uh, is going to have undecidable questions associated with it. That means you can't prove them or disprove them. That was something that everybody thought mathematics was totally immune to. That everything that was either true or false based on some baseline assumptions, yes? And, but what Gödel said is no, you're bound to stumble across questions that are undecidable. Therefore, you would have to either accept them or reject them based on blind faith. You just say, hey, I'm going to assume that's true I'm gonna, or I'm going to assume that's false. And guess what? Guess what Cantor's question ended up being? This was proved in, in the mid-60s by, uh, by Paul Cohen. Guess what his question was proved to be later? <laughs> One of these undecidable questions. Okay? Cantor's question that he drove himself crazy over turns out to be undecidable. Uh, you either have to accept that there is a set between the countable and uncountable infinity. And you just kind of imagine what it is, or you reject it and you say there is nothing between those two. Yeah? Um, there's no way to either prove or disprove that statement. You just have to either accept it or reject it on blind faith. I think that's interesting. Any questions on that? Questions? Well, I had fun. I hope you did too. Um, if you have uh, questions on the final or anything like that, you can email. Uh, you know, you can even set up an appointment over Zoom or what have you if, if uh, you feel like it would be better dealt with in person. Um, but other than that, that's it. Thank you all. There's the question there where it said A, C, or A, B, C, D are predicates and E is the conclusion. Was there like statements yeah. I was supposed to go with it? Or? Well, you, I, I, one of the questions asks you to create the statements. Oh, I must have read that completely wrong. Uh, so you had all those predicates, but then there were statements that you were supposed to build based on those it said, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you were supposed to come up with like a symbolic rendering of that, yeah? Did it have to relate to the question with like the, um, the super, what was that word that you threw in there? Uh, oh, super duper, blah, 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 or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Did it have no. to relate with that one? I didn't think so. Like, well, what do you mean? Relate to it. Like it had to use the, the 